As Xinjiang just said that we're, I gave the same talk two years ago as well, and so I'm going to give you a little update, and so I'm sure there are a lot of you who were not here uh, two years ago, so some of this will be new to you, some of this will be a repeat for those of you who were here two years ago. Uh, Most of what I've been concentrating on lately deals with maritime transportation, uh, ships coming and going, uh, moving things around the globe. Most people on Earth live in a coastal zone because of maritime transportation. Large population centers developed around ports and harbors over centuries and, and even before because maritime transportation is a very efficient way to move things around. Something like 90% of global commerce and 95% of, of U.S. international trade goes by maritime transportation. And this concentration of human activities around ports and harbors, which tend to be in ecologically sensitive estuaries like Tampa Bay and other places, puts a lot of stress on the local ecosystem, but also makes those populations very vulnerable to catastrophic events like hurricanes or sea level rise and, and things like that. Uh, Worldwide ship traffic has increased by about 300% since 1992. As the global economy expands, there's globalization that we've all heard about. Uh, that puts more emphasis on maritime transportation. Traffic has increased in every ocean. Uh, the size of vessels has increased almost exponentially. There was an article in one of the maritime trade publications that I get that the largest container ship just set a record. It carried over 19,000 containers on one vessel. They're launching vessels now that can carry up to 22,000 containers on one ship. These ships are 1,300 to 1,400 feet long with a beam of about 200 feet and a draft of up to 54 feet. Uh, Vessels coming into Tampa Bay can't be drafted to more than about 40 feet or so. Uh, these largest vessels that are carrying containers around now can only go into a couple of ports in the U.S., L.A. Long Beach on the U.S. West Coast or uh, Hampton Roads in Chesapeake Bay. Most of these large ships are geared specifically to going from Southeast Asian ports to northern and, and western European ports. Well, most of you have probably heard about the Skyway Bridge disaster in May of 1980. An inbound vessel, the Summit Venture, encountered an intense squall line, a band of very heavy thunderstorms as it was approaching the center span of the Skyway Bridge, was blown off course, collided with one, or alighted, it's a, a lesion when a vessel hits a fixed object. Uh, <laughs> knocked one of the main supports down. And for the, the southbound span of the bridge, it was a twin span steel girder structure at that time. And the southbound span collapsed and 35 people were killed. Um, these are some pictures from the Tampa Bay Times or the St. Petersburg Times at the, in that day. Um, and the story said that the guys in this yellow car that was sort of hanging over the edge were crawling up the steel grating structure and the one guy looked back and his buddy had gone back to get his golf clubs out of the trunk of the car. So that was a pretty dedicated golfer. Uh, so they rebuilt it and put lots of features into the new bridge that you've probably driven across many times. Uh, put these large rock islands around the main supports and these cylindrical concrete structures called dolphins to protect the supports of the bridge from uh, getting bumped into by things. I found this particular picture online and I'm going to tell you about it in a little bit. We have a, a current sensor that sits under the center span of the bridge that's cabled to a transmitter tower on this dolphin right here. 
that's my boat tied up there as we were servicing those electronics some years ago. Uh, so one of the many responses to that disaster was the local maritime community petitioned the, the U.S. Congress to get additional money put into NOAA's budget for the National Ocean Service to build the very first physical oceanographic real-time system, PORTS, and NOAA actually trademarked that acronym, PORTS. Uh, but it's a network of sensors that measure winds, waves, currents, tides, visibility at critical locations around the harbor, along the ship channel, and in the major port facilities. Uh, it's been operational since 1991. Uh, we operate it in collaboration with the NOAA National Ocean Service. They call their Center for Operational Ocean Products and Services co-ops, as well as the local maritime community. All the data come back by line of sight radio, satellite or cellular modem. Uh, data come in continuously, uh, updated every six minutes. Uh, they do some real-time QAQC on the data as it comes in and it immediately gets posted to the internet and distributed uh, to interested parties. Uh, initially, it was all done by dial-up modem or one of those voice response systems that you call up and a human voice reads off the, the latest data to you. Um, now it's the mostly distributed by internet and other uh, network-based means. But we were, as I'll get to in a minute, we were the very first to ever put real-time data on the internet. Uh, Lene Bamey was an undergraduate intern in my lab back in 1993, and she told me about this new thing called a gopher server that would allow you to share data real-time on what was then the fledgling World Wide Web. So we did that, we put it up on there and we're the very first. Now, of course, that's standard operating procedure for lots of things. Um, I invite you to go to our landing page, just tbports.org, because the official NOAA website is about you know, 65 characters long and I had to paint it on the side of this wave buoy and so TB ports fit better. Uh, but this is uh, one of our main stations out in the center of the bay, that's Jeff Scudder and one of our other techs working on the top of it. It's a big steel tower out in the middle of the bay just at the turn from the main ship channel into the channel going into Port Manatee. It uh, has an acoustic Doppler current profiler nearby on the bottom of the ship channel cabled up to the transmitter here in a full suite of meteorological sensors as well as a, a visibility sensor that basically measures fog. Uh, this is the wave buoy that sits out at the mouth of the ship channel about 10 miles to the west of Egmont Key. Uh, this is us working on the telemetry system for the ADCP that's under the center span of the Skyway Bridge. And this is what we were supposed to have put out yesterday, uh, but again, there's lion at the National Weather Service promised us calm weather and we got out there and it wasn't. Uh, this actually is at the Port of Miami. This is what's called an IATON. It's a, an acoustic Doppler current pro profiler clamped onto the side of a standard uh, Coast Guard channel marker buoy. We've been trying to put one on a channel marker buoy out off of Egmont Key for the past mm, three months now and winds and waves and crew and vessel availability have not coincided. Uh, again, Tampa Bay Ports was the very first of its kind. Uh, in April, I went to the dedication of the Miami port system, which was the 34th, 31st or the 30th port system. Uh, very soon after the port system was inaugurated in Port Everglades down by Fort Lauderdale. So, We've led the way in this. The original configuration of Tampa Bay ports was only eight sites. Uh, there were four water level gauges, two ADCPs, and several wind stations, uh, two independent of the water level sites, and wind sensors at each of the water level sites. Today, we've done quite a bit more beyond that. We've added wave buoy off Egmont Channel. Again, we're about to put the 
ADCP on the channel marker buoy out here. We've added additional uh, ADCPs at the entrance to Port Manatee, as well as additional meteorological uh, systems, particularly around the downtown Tampa port facilities. Tampa Bay is one of the is the largest port in Florida. It's in the top 10 to 15 ports in the U.S. Depending on how you measure things, is it measured by gross tonnage of goods and cargo that's brought in and out? Is it measured by the number of transits or by the economic value of those goods and, and cargo? Uh, the wave buoy we operate in collaboration with the Army Corps of Engineers and the uh, Coastal Data Information Program at Scripps. We were the first to put visibility sensors out in Tampa Bay, as well as the first to put a wave sensor as part of a ports system, but it took us almost 20 years to get NOAA to actually take those data and make it part of the, the ports data stream. As I said, now ports are presently operational in 31 different locations around the U.S. Um, it's rather gratifying to see that, that we were instrumental in, in getting something started. You know, I got to emphasize, this all came out of the NOAA National Ocean Service. We just helped, but we've been running it since the early 90s, since it went operational. This is the acoustic Doppler current profiler that sits under the Skyway Bridge. Well, this is what it looks like when it's sitting on the deck of the ship. The ADCP sits in a little well in a big concrete pyramid, and a cable runs from, that gets set on the, bottom of the ship channel right in the center of the Skyway Bridge. A cable runs from that to a transmitter tower on one of those dolphins. Again, this is me standing on my boat. Uh, this was just a couple of years ago. I got back to my office and I got an email from the chief engineer for the Skyway Bridge at Florida DOT. And the header was, Dr. Luther, smile, you're on candid camera, and that picture was attached. Apparently they have big tracking cameras up on the bridge. Uh, because it sits on the bottom of the ship channel, uh, we use uh, commercial hard hat divers to service it. Uh, we want to be able to talk to them, so if there's a ship coming, we can tell them to please come back to the boat so we can get out of the way. And this is just some of the graphics off of the website. Uh, the, the red dots are the six minute measurements at different depth levels from the ADCP. The blue line in the center panel there is the predicted tide from tidal harmonics. Uh, and you can see that the currents, when this snapshot was taken, were fairly close to the, the tidal predictions, but at times, depending on rainfall or wind patterns, those tidal currents can be significantly different than the tidal predictions, as well as water levels at the different port facilities can be significantly different. Uh, this is the tide gauge over here at the Coast Guard base. This is what it looks like now. It sits on the seawall and it has a little radar transducer that measures the height between a reference plate and the water surface. Surveyors come in and survey into that reference plate, so now you know exactly how high the water level is relative to fixed references on land. The old site looked like a porta potty on stilts over there. We just tore that down. In fact, I'm taking the guys, uh, the CO and his staff from the, the Coast Guard Cutter Vice. They actually built that site in 1980. 90 when Lee Chapin was still involved. Many of you will remember the, the Lee Chapin adventure. Uh, I'll tell you about that over a beer sometime. Um, but they just tore it down uh, a couple of weeks ago, so I'm taking them out for a drink after TGIF today. And this is the, the electronics of the system. And again, the red dots are the uh, observations, the blue line is the predicted, and during this particular time period, they followed each other very well. During a major storm event, like during Hurricane Irma, the winds were out of the north, blew all the water out of the bay, and we had about almost two meters less water in the bay, less water level in the bay than was predicted by the tidal harmonics. Uh, this is the wave buoy that I was just mentioning that sits off of 
uh, the mouth of the ship channel. Uh, again, the data are all managed by the CDIP group at Scripps. Data are telemetered by uh, Iridium satellite modem. This is what it looked like when we first put it in all nice and clean. This is what it looked like about a year later when we went to, to service it. So we have to pull it out about every 18 months and change its batteries and clean it up and paint it. Um, but this is also in the area where harbor pilots, the men and women who guide ships in and out of the ship channel, get on and off inbound or outbound vessels. So they need to know what the wave height uh, period and direction is to know whether or not they're going to be able to climb from their pilot vessel up the pilot ladder onto the deck of the ship or to get back off of the ship again onto their, their pilot boat. Again, as I mentioned, we were the local maritime community here is very, very proactive, uh, very forward thinking, and very collaborative, which doesn't happen in many ports from what I've seen and what I've been told. Uh, the presence of this collaborative nature has allowed us to do a lot of firsts. In fact, we're the only one of those 31 port systems that's closely linked to an academic research institution. So we've sort of pushed the envelope over the years, again, at the urging of the local maritime community as well. Again, we were the first operational ports installation, uh, first to put that data on the internet, uh, the first to include waves and visibility into our network. Uh, we were the first to implement what's now known as the automatic identification system. We did an early prototype of that back in 1998. It's now required on all commercial vessels. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, we established the first vessel traffic system, basically like an air traffic controller that utilizes that AIS data to give advice to vessels coming and going so they don't run into each other. Uh, one of our graduate students, Mark Vincent, working with Boris Galper and myself and Bob Weisberg, developed the first operational nowcast forecast system for Tampa Bay. Mark went on to work for NOAA and developed a whole network of operational forecast systems for other ports. Uh, we were the first to work with the Coast Guard in a prototype to distribute the port's data via the AIS channels. The AIS has certain channels dedicated that can receive med ocean data on board the vessels and display it on their electronic chart plotting systems. And working with the NOAA National Ocean Service and the local National Weather Service office, we were the first to establish what's called a marine channels forecast. I'll talk a little bit more about those. A sad note, just a few weeks ago, um, Jeff Buck, who was the driving force between, behind the establishment of Tampa Bay Ports back in the late 80s, early 90s, at that time he was the general manager of the Tampa Bay Harbor Pilots Association, passed away unexpectedly just a few weeks ago. So the paper I've just submitted on this history of Tampa Bay Ports to the MTS conference uh, is dedicated to him. That's that's him standing on the bow of the, the boat that we hire uh, to go out and service a lot of our vessels or a lot of our systems. In fact, this was on our way back from putting that wave buoy in back in 2015. Again, I mentioned the, the cooperative vessel traffic service. It's run out of the Tampa Port Authority. It's a collaboration between the U.S. Coast Guard and the, the Tampa Port Authority that again monitors all of that AIS feed that gives information on the vessel's position, its speed and direction, uh, all of its cargo information, et cetera, to help guide vessels in and out to keep them from running into bridges or each other. An economic study shows that Tampa Bay Ports has resulted in a decrease in ships running aground by two thirds since it came into existence in 1991 uh, and its operating costs are far far exceeded by its economic benefits. Uh, again don't have to say too much about 
how important it is to have that sort of vessel traffic information. Uh, one of the biggest examples is in downtown Tampa, the main port facilities there. Cruise ships go right past gasoline tankers that are offloading and they don't have a lot of room and cruise ships have an enormous sail area. So if you've got a little bit of extra wind on the beam of the vessel, they have some handling problems and potentially catastrophic results if uh, they zig instead of zag. And in 1993, we had a, a collision amongst a barge carrying jet fuel, a barge carrying fuel oil, and a freighter carrying phosphate ore uh, caused quite a mess. Uh, and that also helped lead to the establishment of that vessel traffic management system. I mentioned the marine channels forecast. Uh, folks at the Weather Service and at the National Ocean Service have combined forces to take all the real-time data that's collected by ports, use it to supply boundary conditions for high resolution uh, now cast forecast models of the hydrodynamics of the bay, combine that with detailed atmospheric forecast, drilling down into giving detailed forecasts at all of these positions along the ship channel, and to then, once an hour, provide a 24-hour forecast for each of those locations of the water levels, the wind speed and direction, the uh, currents, speed and direction, probability of precipitation, significant wave height and visibility or probability of visibility less than one statute mile. Comes in very handy for uh, pilots or for just general recreational boaters going out and playing in, in the bay. And again, this is the first of its kind. It's the only one in existence right now. They plan to roll it out to other uh, port systems, but it was developed here. Uh, having all of this long-term data is useful for lots more than just bringing ships in and out of the bay. We've got data now from those ADCPs in the ship channel, the water level gauges, the MET stations, going back 28 years now. Uh, Hillsborough County Environmental Protection Commission has been doing monthly monitoring at about 56 sites around the bay since the early 1970s. 